while his wife and his two small children are in the house, she's making dinner, and he's in the garage torturing a woman. Rudos killed four young women in the cruelest of circumstances. And it's not about the sex, it's about power. What can I get away with? Keep the foot in a freezer, and that allowed him to relive the sexual fantasy. The act of killing was only foreplay. What was he thinking about prior to picking up a victim? He would drive for hours at a time. He enjoyed killing these girls and mutilating their bodies. This was thrill to him. Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos I write. I post videos pertaining to literally kind of whatever I want. Conspiracy theories, controversial people, true crime, and all things spooky, scary, skeleton. So if you're into any of that, you can subscribe. And if not, totally chill, totally fine. Let's get down. Let's talk a little bit. Let's hang out. Today we're going to be talking about the, the foot fetish killer, aka Jerry Brodus. But before we get into this story, I do want to give a little disclaimer. In no way am I shaming people with a foot fetish, you know. As long as you're not hurting anyone, I think it's fine. Like literally do whatever you want, do whatever fits your fancy. But it only starts to get bad when you start killing people because of it. So that is the story that we're gonna be talking about today. But speaking of ruining our planet and reducing our carbon footprint, Literally no one was talking about I would that. like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Ren. Let's admit it, we all are guilty of doing something that wrecks our planet or increases our carbon footprint. I myself do it and I feel really, really guilty afterwards. I'll just be sitting here like, dang, that really sucks that we're just ruining our planet to the point where even the own air that we breathe is even toxic for us. That sucks. I wish there was something that I could do to re this or at least help it in some way. I say that as I'm driving in my GMC truck to my third coffee of that day. We're all guilty of it, but thanks to Ren, they can now put your guilt at ease and gives you a really good starting point on to how you can even reduce your carbon footprint. All you have to do is take a short quiz and figure out where your carbon footprint is at. And from there, they will give you a price that will offset your carbon footprint and all that money will go towards projects such as planting trees, protecting our rainforest, Forests. It doesn't take long at all, probably like a few minutes, and it's so easy and such a perfect way to start helping the climate crisis. Of course, it's impossible to reduce your carbon footprint to zero, especially in the world that we live in, but REN gives you easy ways to reduce your carbon footprint and even easier ways to directly offset it and help save our beautiful world. Once you sign up to your monthly contributions, you actually receive monthly updates about exactly which trees you have planted and exactly where your money was going, and it's honestly such a breath of fresh air, no pun intended. It's just so nice to see exactly where your money is going because sometimes you'll give your money to these places and be like, mm, are they actually using it for what they say they are? But with Ren, you can physically see like, oh, this is exactly where my money is going. So I feel more secure in contributing to this cause. We always talk about the climate crisis and how one day we're gonna help and how one day we're all gonna put, put our hands together, you know, one, two, three, hurrah, and try to save this world. But why don't we start today? By clicking the link in the description, Ren will actually actually be planting 10 extra trees to the very first 100 people that use my referral link down below or you can go to ren.co to learn more information. So again, thank you so so much to Ren for sponsoring today's video. This is actually like a really big cause that I believe in and I think it's honestly, you know, add aside a really really easy way to reduce your carbon footprint and start actually, you know, getting started with reducing your carbon footprint instead of just saying like, "Oh, I'll just ride a bike to work. This is so much easier and you can do it from your the comfort of your own home. Okay, I'm done hyping rent up, okay? Back to your video. I got a new lens. I'm not sure if like, oh my God. And the guy next door is cutting his bush. Let's film a video. I love the background music. Oh my God. I love this song. This is my favorite part, ready? This is my favorite part.
Jerome Henry Brodus, aka Jerry Brodus, was born on January 31st, 1939, making him an Aquarius in Webster, South Dakota. He was born into his family of his mother, his father, and his older brother, Larry. So before Jerry was born, the mother actually prayed and prayed and hoped that Jerry would be a girl because she just wanted, you know, one boy, one girl. But when Jerry came out a boy, she was very, very disappointed and she made Jerry feel very, very disappointed. This kind of led to a very abusive relationship with Jerry and the parents and Jerry and Larry as well. The family just became very neglectful of him, didn't really care about his feelings or his needs, didn't really love him or like give him any love and attention. While Larry got tons of special treatment, he was treated like a king basically. He was definitely the favorited child. Jerry was about six years old. They moved from South Dakota to Salem, Oregon because in South Dakota, the parents were farmers, but because of World War I, the farming business went down and they were forced to move elsewhere. They moved to Salem, Oregon, and it was there where the father tried to find a job, but was unable to keep a job slash find a job because of his anger issues. He would always lash out on all of the customers, get into heated arguments. With that, he kept on losing his jobs. And also with that, it led the family to move around a lot. And his anger issues didn't just stop at work. The father would frequently come home and put all of his anger onto his family as well, especially Jerry. As I said, Jerry was just for some reason not the, oh, better. Oh my God, should I put on that light too? I'm a mess today. Anyway, the father would come home and take all of his anger out on the children and the wife and especially Jerry, but this was during the 1940s. And because of this, like it wasn't easy for the mother to just divorce and take the kids because divorce was such a taboo thing back then. You basically just got married and if you didn't like your husband or wife, you just dealt with it until you died. And this just goes to show how neglectful his family was of him. His family would literally just let Jerry at five years old go out by himself, stay out for hours, and wouldn't even care about where he was at or what he was doing. He would frequently go play in the junkyard. One day he was at the junkyard and he came across these pair of stiletto high heel shoes. He was absolutely fascinated by them. It was just so mesmerizing to look at. So Jerry was like, like, I want to take these home with me. Right when he walked in the door, he was greeted by his mother that was coming out as he was coming in. His mother stopped him in his tracks and was like, what is that? And he was like, what is what? She was like, those shoes, where did you get those shoes? And he was like, well, I just found them in the junkyard. Like, I thought they were really pretty, so I wanted to take them home. And the mother started screaming at Jerry, basically demanding him to go back to the junkyard and return the stilettos because he's a boy and boys cannot wear heels. That is way too girly for him and he should not even be holding those. Jerry walks back to the junkyard and then right when he's about to return the shoes, he thinks to himself, he's like, no, I like these shoes. I'm going to keep these shoes. He walks back to his house and he sneaks it into his house and he puts the shoes underneath his bed. Over the next couple of weeks, he would frequently take the shoes out just to admire them and look at them, try them on and walk around with them. Until one day, unfortunately, when five-year-old Jerry, you know, is walking around with these stilettos, performing his RuPaul Drag Race audition, the mother walks in and she's like, give me those. And so then she snatches the shoes right off of Jerry and drags him by his neck outside, starts up a fire in the fire pit and throws his stilettos into the fire and forces Jerry to watch the shoes burn all while yelling at him and telling him that he should not be wearing those shoes. Those shoes are for girls. It was said that at this point in Jerry's life, this is kind of what sparked a very big interest but also a little bit of a embarrassment or like humiliation a little bit because he just kind of associated all of these high heel shoes with the fact that he's not allowed to touch them he's not allowed to look at them and so when you tell a kid not to do something they're going to want to do it even more and that's exactly what happened within jerry's situation although this you know event was very traumatizing for him it did want him to go out and learn more about shoes you know what was so bad about these shoes that he 
his mom didn't want him to see and he wanted to find out. As I said, when Jerry would play outside, he would frequently play outside by himself and there was a neighbor, an old woman that would see him always playing outside by himself and she was aware of like his toxic and abusive family situation. So typically this old woman would like bring Jerry in, feed him and take care of him. Basically her just kind of giving him the motherly affection that he should be getting. So when Jerry would like stay out for hours at a time, that's typically where he was until unfortunately one day she actually ended up passing away and this was a very very big deal for Jerry because this was like the first woman that had ever shown him any sort of attention. Not only did that just happen, his five-year-old best friend who was also a girl had passed away as well. It was very very hard for Jerry at this point like that was just a lot of trauma and emotion that he just didn't know how to process or feel correctly all at the same time you know like with the stiletto situation but then his neighbor died and then his best friend died. So then shortly after that when Jerry was six years old and about to enter into school that is when the family moved from Salem Oregon to California. Even in school Jerry was kind of bullied because there was this one incident where he was playing you know just like recess in the classroom and he crawled underneath the teacher's desk and underneath the teacher's desk he finds a pair of high heel shoes. He took the shoes and he just started to play with them. After playing with these shoes for a while he's like I'm gonna take these home. Obviously at the end of the day the teacher is like where are my shoes? So she asked the class to help her find her shoes and eventually they find the shoes in Jerry's backpack. When the teacher asked Jerry why did you take my shoes? He was just sort of sitting there speechless. He didn't really know what to say because he thought that he was like in really really big trouble. To Jerry's surprise he was not. The teacher just kind of saw this as a harmless act and was like oh you know he probably just wanted to play with my shoes and so that's fine. And Jerry for the first time wasn't ashamed for liking these like high heel shoes. It didn't make him feel so alienated. Now when he was seven years old and in the second grade Jerry unfortunately had failed the second grade and had to retake it. This was due to his attendance because he had tons of health issues. So on top of being abused at home he also had tons of health issues. As I said his family was just so neglectful that like they really didn't care. Nonetheless he did have to retake the second grade which made Larry, the older brother, look even better. Jerry, I know Jerry and Larry like sound very similar and you might get it mixed up, but anyway, Jerry. Jerry is the main character, the protagonist. Him failing the second grade literally just made Larry look like even a more of a perfect child because even Larry, like he had perfect grades. He had all these friends. He was like in sports. As for Jerry, he didn't really have any of that. All he had was like health issues. He had bad grades because he wasn't showing up to school because of his health issues. But one day the family had over a new family that had just moved into their neighborhood, just like over for dinner and this family consisted of the mother, the father, two teenage daughters, and a son that was around the same age as Jerry. When Jerry met this family for the very first time, the first thing that he noticed, you can probably guess, one of the teenage girls was wearing high heels. He just grew like a really big fascination with these shoes and so then later on they're having dinner and whatnot and that teenage girl that's wearing the heels, she starts to complain to her mother about how she's feeling a little sick and so then and Jerry's mother tells the girl like hey if you're not feeling so well there's a bedroom upstairs like go lie down take a nap. The girl goes upstairs and takes a nap. Jerry sits downstairs with the family for a little bit. After like maybe 15 minutes Jerry excuses himself and says he needs to go to the bathroom and so when he goes upstairs to go to the bathroom he doesn't go to the bathroom but instead he goes into the bedroom where the girl is sleeping to see if she had taken off her high heels. Now the girl hadn't taken off her high heels and so then Jerry started to take the high heels off of the girl while she was sleeping. He was successful at getting one shoe off and when he was able to get one shoe off that is when he saw the woman's foot. This is kind of where the foot fetish sort of thing started to erupt into him. I said I'm not shaming anybody who has this, I'm just saying it turns very deadly in the future and this is just kind of like the origin of it. He then becomes very fascinated with their feet and he starts to associate feet and woman's shoes with very soft and silky and feminine. Now obviously the girl woke up and she was like Jerry <laughs> what are you doing? She just kind of laughed because as I said Jerry at this point was like seven years old 
old. She was like, oh my God, like, are you trying to take off my shoes? Because you know how sometimes when you sleep on a bed, you take off your shoes first. So the girl just thought that that's what Jerry was doing. Like, oh, you're so sweet. Are you taking off like my shoes for me? She, because of that, didn't tell Jerry's mother or anything. She just thought it was like a cute, like gentleman sort of thing he was doing. As I was mentioning earlier, this family had a son that was close in Jerry's age. This friend and Jerry would frequently play together a lot because Jerry was super shy and awkward so he didn't really have many friends and then this new guy he also just moved into town so he didn't really have friends either so they would hang out together a lot. Now Jerry and his friend would play this really weird game. I forgot the son's name but we'll just call him son. They would go to the son's house him and Jerry and they would play this game where they would go into the two teenagers bedrooms so like his sister's bedrooms and take their underwear and try them on which you know like in that sense it's harmless you know you're just kind of playing around it did start to harm things a little bit when jerry would sneakingly steal the girl's underwear he would try them on but then he just wouldn't take them off and he would tell the son that he did take them off when he didn't and then he would bring them and take them home with him at around nine to ten years old that is when jerry I didn't even really mention this but the mother was very conservative strict and religious jerry was caught doing another really odd thing basically jerry for some reason he just wanted to build like an underground tunnel went into his backyard and he started digging this really deep tunnel like super deep tunnel and of course a 10 year old boy cannot like build a whole entire tunnel and underground thing in his backyard by himself so eventually his mother found out because she's like why are you building a deep hole into the backyard he was trying to build an underground tunnel for what he wanted to call a dungeon where he would keep all of his women at mind you at this point jerry's like 10 years old so this is a really odd thing for a 10 year old boy to be saying since the family neglected Jerry so much they didn't really care about what he was saying at all so the mom was like okay get back inside like now I have to fix this hole in the backyard thanks a lot Jerry like not really even understanding that what he just said was indeed a little odd. As time goes on, when Jerry hits like his preteens and teenagers, his parents were extremely conservative. They did not really like to talk about anything taboo. They were also very religious. They never wanted to talk about the sex conversation or anything like that, which I feel like you should do with all of your children. Even if it is an uncomfortable conversation to have, it should be said. Like just so you know that this is an environment where it's very, you know, comfortable to talk about everything like that and if they do have any questions, it could, you know, eliminate any mistakes in the future. The mom or the dad did not say anything to their sons about relationships or sex or anything like that. They basically just put them out into the world and told them to teach themselves. As for Larry though, Jerry's older brother, he was kind of a little bit more experienced when it came to this area because he did have a lot of friends. His friends kind of educated him on all of this. But as for Jerry, since he didn't really have any friends, he was basically just kind of left in the dark and didn't really know much about it. I okay i'm not saying i feel bad for jerry completely i just feel bad for jerry in the childhood that he lived because every time jerry would ask to like go out to like football games or like enjoy life basically you know hang out with a friend that he met his parents would always tell him no you have to stay home and you have to do all of your chores while larry was able to go to football games go to school dances hang out with friends stay out late it was because he had no chores to do. Larry was out and like out and about living a life while Jerry had to stay home and do all of the chores like the Cinderella he was. One day Jerry at around like 16 years old and you know when you're a teenager you got all these hormones going on and since no one was teaching him anything he basically just had to like sit there and deal with it and like think that he was weird. So then one day Jerry goes and starts snooping around Larry's room as he's cleaning up the house. He goes through one of Larry's drawer and he finds this drawer filled with naked women drawings. So drawings that Larry had done of naked women. So Jerry, being super curious, he takes all of Larry's drawings and he brings them into his room. He's sitting on his bed and he's just looking at all of these drawings, kind of mesmerized with the worst timing possible 
the mother walks in. It looks like Jerry had drawn them. And so the mom starts yelling at Jerry and he, for some reason, just sort of takes it because he realizes if I tell her they're Larry's drawings, she's gonna get mad at me for snooping through Larry's things. But if I tell her that it's my drawings, then she's gonna get mad at me for drawing naked women. So either way, he knew he was gonna get in trouble. So he just kind of sat there and took the punishment. Even like as he got older, like 16 years old, him and his mother's relationship was just not the best. It was very, very toxic. He saw his mom as a representation for all women in general. He didn't have a, you know, hatred for all women. He just kind of assumed that all women were very strong, dominant, rude, you know, nasty, made you feel bad. He didn't really have much luck for girls as well either. Larry was more of the conventionally more attractive sibling, while Jerry, he was overweight, he had had acne, he was very shy and awkward, he didn't really talk much, he didn't really have much luck when it came to girls. And so since he didn't really have much luck when it came to girls, he just thought, okay, well, if I can't get girls, I'm gonna get the closest thing to girls, and that is their underwear. Jerry started to sneak into girls' backyards and take their underwear that was hanging up on like the clotheslines and would just steal them and take them home until it got to a point where he even started to break into girls' houses and stealing their underwear. And when he did take these like underwears home, he tried to do a little something something on them picking up what I'm putting down but he couldn't ever he couldn't ever um complete the mission sail the boat he could never do that and so he thought okay well if I can't you know do my thing on these underwears, then that means I need something bigger. Jerry went to one of the houses that he stole underwear from. He knocked on the door and the girl came to the door and he basically told the girl that he was an undercover cop and that he was doing an investigation on stolen underwear in the area and asked her, hey, have you gotten any of your underwear stolen? And she's like, yeah. And he was like, perfect. You are, you know, you're a victim, so I should probably talk to you. He says, come and meet me at my house at this time and this date, and we need to discuss your statement so I can bring it back to the police. Now, the girl, she was, I believe, 16 at this point. She was just like, oh, this is just, you know, this is just a kid, dorky kid. What's the worst that could happen? So eventually she goes to his house on that time and that date. And when she walks in the house, she starts saying, you know, hello, is anyone home? And she hears Jerry upstairs yell, yes, I'm up here, come upstairs. So she walks into the room where she heard the voice and starts looking around and realizes that there's no one in the room. And this is the point where she starts to get a little bit panicky and out from the closet, comes Jerry in a mask and with a knife and demands the girl to take off all of her clothes. And so in a fright, you know, the girl did because he has a knife in his hand. So she takes off all of her clothes and he basically just starts taking pictures of her. He took an entire film roll, so that's about 36 pictures, and told her to pose for the pictures. And when he was done, realized that the film roll was out and he just sprinted out of the house. And when he sprinted out of the house, of course the girl, she quickly put back on her clothes. So then she was able to run out of the house. Jerry runs out of the house. And whilst he runs out of the house, he ditches the mask, he ditches the knife, and he ditches the camera as well. He just throws the three things and so he goes back in there and as he's running back in there the girl is running out with her clothes back on and Jerry runs up to her and he's like oh my god are you okay did you see that masked man back there he was so scary he locked me in a barn and he told me to like take off all my clothes and take pictures like I'm so glad you're okay but this is so crazy and you don't have to call the police because I am the police the girl knew that it was Jerry in the mask so she just didn't really know what to say or like she was just very very confused because of this incident the girl ended up never giving a statement to the police because she was just so traumatized she didn't really 
want to, you know, talk about it. She just wanted to immediately forget it and block it out. So she was scared that Jerry was gonna come to her house if she did go to the police because he knew where she lived. When he got the pictures developed, it was not as euphoric as Jerry had hoped. He was just like, oh, that's what the female body looks like? I was thinking of like something more extravagant. I thought it was gonna be a little bit more magical than that, um, which, a human body is a human body. We basically all look the same. So like, I don't know. Nonetheless, he would try to do the same thing to the underwear to these pictures. After eight months of trying to do it to these pictures, he was like, I need something more. This is just not doing it for me anymore. One day when he was again, 17 years old, he was at school and he asked one of the girls at school that he thought was cute if she wanted a ride home. The girl was like, okay, I'm gonna give this like little nerdy boy a chance. You know, maybe he just wants to drive me home and be a gentleman. But unfortunately, Jerry does not drive her home and in fact drives her to a remote location in the woods. He parks his car and he demands the girl to strip naked. The girl is like, no, I'm not gonna strip naked for you. Jerry basically unbuckled her seatbelt and started beating her and beat her so bad that she fell out of the car and started to basically force her to take off her clothes. And thank God, a car drove past and saw what was going on. So these people quickly got out and they were like, what is going on? And then they see the girl all bloodied up and they see Jerry, you know, with blood all over his hands. Jerry stares at these people and says, oh, she just fell out of the car and I was helping her up the girl, she was on the ground, but she wasn't able to say anything because Jerry had beat her so bad that she was unable to speak because she had so much like blood all over her mouth. Her like jaw was clenched up. Thank God the people in this car was like, okay, we're going to take you home. They take her to the hospital. And then at the hospital, that is when she gives her statement to the police. Police went to go find Jerry. They eventually found him. And when they did, they searched his room. They found all of the pictures pictures and the underwear. This next part I already know is going to make you guys so mad because it made me so mad. I know we shouldn't be saying that we hate men, but sometimes like it's so hard. Like sometimes it's really, really hard. Go into Jerry's room and they find the underwear. They find the picture, the picture of the naked girl that he forced to take pictures. And like in the picture, she's crying because she's freaking out. They clearly see that this woman is like in pain. They ask Jerry about the underwear. Jerry, his explanation is that those underwears were not stolen, but they were bought. He bought women's underwear and he would basically, you know, just collect them. Police kind of saw this as weird, but it technically wasn't a crime. As I said, it was always clean underwear that he would take. It was never used. Well, it's clean underwear, so we can't really charge him with anything. Like, what if he actually just did buy these underwear? And they're like, okay, well, how do you explain these pictures? Jerry explains the pictures and says that one day a guy came up to him in school and he doesn't remember what he looked like or what his name was, handed him this film camera and said, if you don't develop these pictures, I'm gonna beat you up. And so, so then he gets the pictures developed and those were the pictures on the film. He never saw the man again, but that basically explains why he had those photos. And you know what the police said? They were like, okay, they believed him. They believed him. They literally, they, they, they believed him. They believed him. They were like, makes sense. We all, happens to the best of us, kid. Oh my God. Don't we all get men on the street that like give us cameras and then say, I'm gonna beat you up if you don't film, if you don't develop these. And then you never see that man again. Oh, it happens to me at least twice a week. He didn't get charged with the first girl. He didn't get charged with the stolen underwear. The only thing he got charged with was the assault of the girl, like the people found on the side of the road getting beat. He went to court, no jail time nine months in a psychiatric ward and he wasn't even staying there he was going to school during the day and then at night and like in the morning he would go back to the psychiatric hospital nine months in a psychiatric hospital and that's it goodbye you're good you're good now right you 
you, you would tell me if you did, you were gonna do that again, right? If you say you're not gonna do it again, we'll let you go, cause you would tell me, right? All right, we trust you. Go graduate high school, kid. He graduated high school back in 1957, and after high school, he didn't really want to go to college. He just felt like college wasn't for him. That is when he became a electronic technician. So basically, he would work on like the wires of like lighting and all of the electronics in different buildings. And so he did that for a couple years until in 1961, at 20 years old, he just realized he didn't want to do that anymore. And so then that's when he decided to join the army instead. After eight months, he was discharged because he kept on telling all of his bunkmates this story. In the middle of the night, every single night, there was this Korean woman that would come into his room and try to get it going with him, but he kept on declining her offer. Of course, his bunkmates are like, okay, nice one, Jerry. If that doesn't happen, we would hear it because we're right there. We're like literally six feet away from each other sleeping. Jerry's like, I, I, it is happening and I'm gonna prove that it's happening. And so then he goes up to his lieutenant and he's like, lieutenant, there's a Korean woman coming around here every single night and she's trying to like have intercourse with me and I keep on pushing her down but she just is very very persistent and she won't leave me alone. His commanding officer is like wow Jerry that's such a like scary story you should definitely report this to the psychiatrist and after one session with the psychiatrist that is when he was discharged after eight months of being in there because the psychiatrist deemed him as unwell. When he was discharged he had to live back home so then when Jerry came back Larry had his own room but Jerry's room was already transformed he had really no choice but to sleep in the shed in the backyard because his parents were not going to get rid of I think it was like a workout room or something like that whilst he was sitting in there you know unemployed just discharged from the army he started to kind of go back to his adolescent urges, fascination for women and feet and shoes. He would frequently, you know, just stare at women, sort of like people watch. At first it was sort of harmless until he came across this one woman who had bright red high heels on. And immediately when he saw this, he became fascinated with this woman. So fascinated to the point where he ended up following this woman all the way home, followed her all the way into her apartment building and up to her apartment door. Right when the woman was about to open up her apartment door, Jerry comes up behind her and puts her in a chokehold and knocks her out. Jerry, when he realizes what he had just done, he starts freaking out and he doesn't know what to do because he's like, oh my God, why did I just do that? He leaves her body there. He doesn't wake her up. He doesn't even really check to see if she's alive or anything. He basically just takes her bright red high heels and and takes them back to the house. And that is where he, you know, kept most of his shoes that he would get from women. Eventually, later down the road, he got another job as a electronic technician at a radio station. For the first time in Jerry's life, he actually started to get a few friends. One day he's talking to his friends about how he's looking for a girlfriend and one of his friends says, hey, I got this girl named Darcy. She's cute, she's single, and I think you'd really like her. Jerry decides to go on a date with Darcy. His intention with Darcy is to just, you know, knock her out and take her shoes. For some reason, Darcy was different in the fact that Darcy reminded him a lot of the old woman, remember the old woman that lived next door and like gave Jerry all this love and affection all the time. When he started to get to know Darcy a little bit better, he didn't want to hurt her. He didn't want to really do anything with her. For once, he actually had a woman in his life that he not only loved, but also respected. So then after a few months of dating, Jerry just slowly starts to fall more and more in love with Darcy to the point where he wanted to propose to Darcy. Darcy. He goes up to Darcy's parents and asks for permission. Can I propose to your daughter? We want to get married. But Darcy's parents immediately say no because Darcy's parents did not like Jerry at all, mostly because of the age gap. At this point, Jerry was 22 and Darcy was 17, which, you know, now that's a little weird, but back then, like literally people were getting married 22 and 16. As for the parents, they didn't really like that age gap. Darcy 
Marcy has a lot going for her right now. She's graduating high school. She wants to go to college. And if you, you know, marry her, that's going to completely defeat all of her future plans. Jerry tells this information to Darcy and he's like, hey, wanted to propose to you, but your parents said no. And Darcy's like, oh my God, I hate my parents. They comprise this plan to basically get Darcy pregnant so that the parents have no choice but to, you know, agree to the marriage. It's very like taboo during this time to get a divorce or to be a single mother. So to prevent all of those stares, they would have no choice but to agree upon the marriage. Six weeks later, that is when Darcy found out that she was indeed pregnant. She told her parents and her parents were kind of cornered and forced to agree upon this marriage. Jerry and Darcy ended up getting a place together. And when they did get a place together, Jerry actually requested Darcy every time she was, you know, walking around the house, cleaning, cooking, whatever. She could only do it naked. The only thing she was allowed to have on her were high heels. She basically just walked around the house completely naked all day long with nothing but high heels. And every once in a while, Jerry would stop Darcy and tell her to pose for a picture. Fast forward nine months later, she has the baby and the baby comes comes out to be a girl that they name Megan. Even after they had the baby, Darcy would still walk around the house naked until Megan turned around like four years old. And that is when Darcy was like, yeah, maybe I should start putting on clothes now. Like this is getting a little weird. Jerry agreed that like, yes, you should probably put back on your clothes. But my only condition is that you continue wearing high heels. Darcy did not like this idea because the high heels by wearing them every single day, all day long, they really started to hurt her feet and her knees and her back. Every time she would bring up the idea to Jerry of like, I don't want to wear these high heels anymore. He would turn very aggressive and say like, oh, you don't want to wear your high heels anymore. It's because you don't love me anymore. Later on down the road, you know, Megan was about four years old. That is when Darcy falls pregnant again with their son named Jason. With two kids and a wife, Jerry starts realizing that he's going to need a lot more money than what he's making now. So while Darcy was pregnant, started to move around a lot. So eventually they settled in Portland, Oregon, and that is where they had their second child named Jason. Now, a really odd thing about Jason is that the mother, Darcy, she requested Jerry not to be in the delivery room when Jason was being born, which was very odd. Wouldn't you kind of want your partner to be in there with you? So then with this, Jerry kind of saw as well that Darcy was slowly starting to fall out of love with him. And so he tried to kind of savor their marriage a little bit by, and this is really weird, he would take pictures of himself in women's underwear, Jerry would, and he would leave the pictures around the house for Darcy to find, hoping that when she finds it, he she would like confront him about it. But instead, when Darcy found them, she literally just threw them away. Like she didn't care about them. She just pretended like she never saw them. So then since he wasn't getting the love and attention from Darcy anymore, that is kind of when he started to stalk women again. One day when he he was at work, he actually suffered a pretty bad injury at work. He was electrocuted with a 480 volt, a shock so bad that it flew him across the room. And due to this shock, he suffered some brain damage, specifically the part of the brain that controls impulses. That part of his brain was damaged after this accident. Now that he has some damage to his impulses, plus him starting to get into stalking women again, it's not looking too good for anyone. One night when Jerry is out doing his usual stalking, he finds a woman and stalks her all the way up to her apartment like he did before. But instead, this time, he only followed her up to her apartment door, like the front door. And he actually waited to see which light, like from the windows, turned on so he knew exactly which apartment she lived in. Eventually, he saw a light pop on and he saw the woman walk across her living room, you know,
know, confirming that this is exactly where she lived. He waited until he was, you know, sure that she was asleep and he snuck into her house and attempted to steal her underwear. All of this commotion of the break-in eventually, you know, woke up the woman. When he realized that he had woken up the woman, he started to panic. And before when he panicked, he just took the shoes and left her alone. But now since he kind of has trouble with his impulses, he doesn't just run away, but instead hops on top of the woman, knocks her out, rapes her with her unconscious body. And so this time he does finish. Whole entire act itself, it's the adrenaline leading up, it's the, you know, unconscious body. All of that combined is the only way that he's ever able to complete. And with this feeling also came all of his childhood feelings. Remember when he was 10 years old and he wanted to keep that dungeon? So now that he's older with his own house, he realized since he knew now that he was into necrophilia, he wanted to have an entire freezer filled with like different women and he wanted to perform sexual acts on these dead women. So he started to kind of look around for victims to kind of start up this thing. January 26th of 1968, a 19 year old girl came to his door. She was a door-to-door uh, -door salesman for en encyclopedias. So she basically, you know, she knocks on the door, Jerry opens it and she gives her usual pitch for these encyclopedias. Jerry, when she's done giving her pitch, he was like, oh my god, you know what? I'm actually a teacher and I'm really interested in all of your encyclopedias. Do you mind, you know, if we walked down to my office and we talked about this a little bit more? So the woman walks inside and walks down to the basement into his office and immediately when she walks down there, he chokes her. He checks her pulse to make sure that she's still alive, but for some reason, Jerry just gets this urge to strangle her, basically just strangles her until she dies. Now with this, he starts to panic even more. He's like, oh my God, I just killed her. Like that was not the plan. Instead of, you know, like trying to hide the body first thing, he takes the girl's body and all of, you know, the underwear and stuff that he had, strips her naked and puts her in all these different high heels and underwear that he owned and took pictures of her and when he was done taking pictures of her he put her down underneath the steps and went upstairs because i didn't even mention this his family is upstairs like his wife and two kids are just chilling upstairs while all of this stuff is going on he goes back upstairs and he tells his wife to take the kids out to eat this was you know just a way for the kids and the wife to get out of the house this gave jerry an open window to dispose of the body once the family left he took the body out from underneath the the stairs as he was trying to like dispose of the body he realized that he actually didn't want the body completely gone and so since he couldn't keep this body underneath the stairs forever he decided to then take a trophy as i said he had a really big thing for shoes and feet and so he thought that what if he just had a foot that he could keep around all the time. It's very small, so it's very easy to like keep frozen and stuff. Chopped off her foot, took her body, threw it in the back of his trunk, drove out to a lake and attached her body to like a very heavy car part so that when he threw her body into the lake, she would just sink to the bottom and she wouldn't float up. So that's exactly what he did. And then he went home that night and acted like, you know, nothing had happened. About two days later, that is when the family of this girl declared her missing because she had never came home from work. So of course the parents were frantic. They were all over the place. The police were also on this as well. They even like established a search team to go out and try to find this young girl, but they just could not find her. Later on that year, Jerry was actually given a new job at a place located in Salem, Oregon, where he was originally from. So they moved from Portland, Oregon to Salem so he could do this new job. One day when Jerry is driving home from work, he pulls off to the side of the road because he sees this woman on the side of the road with her car and another car in front of it and two men outside their car talking to the woman. Pulls over, he sees this woman who turns out to be 23 year old named Jane and apparently Jane's car had broken down on the side of the road and turns out it's not something that could just be fixed with jumper cables. She actually needed a very specific car part that the two guys that like pulled over to try to help her, they did not have. Jerry checks out the car and he's like, wait, 
I actually have this car part at home. Jane, want to, you know, come back with me and get this car part? We can take that car part and like fix your car right here and I'll do it for free. The two men and Jane didn't really see anything wrong with this. Kind man, you know, wanting to help me out fix my car for free so I don't really care. And he drove Jane back to his house and what do you know, he did not have a car part. He's in the car and he fakes looking around for his keys and he tells Jane, oh my God, I'm so silly. I told totally forgot my house key. Do you mind if we sit here for a little bit and wait for my wife to come home because she actually has a house key? And Jane's like, yeah, sure. Sitting in the car, they're just kind of talking. Jerry says to Jane like, hey, do you want to play a game? And Jane's like, what kind of game? And he's like, I bet you can't tell me how to tie a bow without showing me how to tie a bow. And she's like, okay, yeah, I feel like I could do that. He gets in the back seat. And so his back is like facing towards her. Okay, say out loud exactly how to tie a bow and like I'll see if you can do it. What actually happens is that he gets in the back seat and instead of tying the bow he gets a leather strap and he wraps it around Jane's neck and chokes her until she's knocked out. Now of course he actually did have a house key this entire time so he dragged Jane's body out into the garage and that is when he started to perform necrophilia on her. He took pictures of her in all these different underwear and high heels and he also hung her up on like a pulley sort of. So he, she was basically just hanging there and he kept her there for a long time. Even when the family went out of town for Thanksgiving, she was still hanging up there and he just left her in the garage. Eventually, you know, he realized that he couldn't keep the body here for long because it was gonna smell and decompose. He just decided to dispose of the body, but before disposing of it, he needed to take a trophy. But this time, instead of taking a foot, he decided to take off a breast. He, you know, took the body, put her in the trunk, tied her to a heavy car part, and threw her over the same bridge as he did with the first girl. Now, in March of 1969, that is when an 18-year-old by the name of Karen was home from college, and she was spending time with her family, and she was supposed to meet her mother at a specific grocery store so they could go shopping together. Karen never showed up to this shopping date with her mother, and so she was like, okay, well, maybe she just forgot, and so she called Karen. Karen didn't pick up. She called Karen's university friends, and they're like, no, we haven't seen Karen. Like she's just home for the holidays, I thought. The mother calls the father and says, have you heard from Karen? I can't find Karen anywhere. And the father hasn't seen Karen either. Police show up and they start investigating the area, trying to, you know, go to all of her favorite shops. And that is when they realize in the parking lot of the department store was in fact Karen's car. That showed police that Karen was in fact at the store but she wasn't at the store. What do you know? Surprise, surprise, it was Jerry behind all of this, but the police didn't know this. He was in the parking lot of this department store because he was about to go inside until he catches 18-year-old Karen getting out of her car. And for some reason, there was no trigger to when Jerry saw a victim that he liked. He basically just saw her and then knew that he had to have her, which is very, very terrifying. Jerry approaches Karen and pulls out a fake gun and tells Karen if she gets into his car that he will not hurt her. Karen, extremely terrified, she abides by what Jerry is telling her to do and gets into Jerry's car and her and Jerry drive off to Jerry's house. Jerry basically did to Karen what he did to all of his other victims. But what was different about Karen is that for our last two victims, basically he knocked them out and took pictures of them whilst they were knocked out. But in Karen's case, he actually asked her to be conscious. He pulled her out into the backyard and told her to take off all of her clothes and that he was going to take pictures. And then after that, he hung her on the pulley and that is how she died. And that is when he performed necrophilia and did the same exact thing as he did to the two other girls. Took her, put her in the trunk, tied a heavy car part, and threw her into the same lake as he did his two other victims. Although the family, you know, doesn't know this, they're still out there searching for Karen, trying to figure out where she is. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. My camera died, but I have a donut and coffee. <laughs>
Later on the next year, in April of 1969, Jerry went to another parking garage and he was just, you know, lurking around, same thing that he did at the department store. And he comes across a 24 year old college receptionist. She was a mother of two and currently in a divorce. And when she was going from her work to her car, she was actually on her way to one of her court meetings. So as I said, Jerry, whenever he saw his victim, he basically just went for it. Jerry comes up and pulls the same tactic as he did with the last woman where he had a fake gun and he told her if she doesn't come with him to his car then he will not hurt her. She basically just started screaming and ran away. Chasing after her he tackled her to the ground. Uh, Jerry puts his hand over Sharon's mouth to kind of muffle her screams and when he does she bites the skin of his hand like this I don't know what this piece of skin is called. You know this piece of skin? Bites onto that piece of skin and does not let go. Jerry, when he's talking about this after the fact, her head was just dangling off of his hand. Till eventually, after all of that, a car drove into the parking garage and saw the two. And immediately when Jerry saw this car, he ran off. The girl was taken to the hospital and she gave a statement to the police because she was very up close and personal with him and he wasn't wearing a mask or anything. She got a clear visual of his face. Now his description was in with this like potential suspect for all these missing women. And Jerry went home and he kind of felt really defeated because this was the very first girl that had gotten away. He basically was like, you know what? Who cares? You know, another one bites the dust. That's fine. I'm gonna go out and try to get another victim. So he goes out the next day and he sees 15 year old Gloria Smith walking home from school. So this girl is walking down a like suburban street where there's hedge bushes along the road, he gets out of his car and he hides behind one of the bushes, waits to hear uh, until like Gloria's footsteps become louder and louder. He jumps out of the bush and tries to grab her. He kind of mistimed it because she was actually only like three feet away from him instead of right there. So his hands just kind of went like that. Gloria gets the idea and she turns around and just starts running. Jerry is chasing after her, but the girl is screaming. Jerry just decides to give it up because he's like, this looks very bad. If I'm just chasing a screaming girl, you know, people are going to look out their windows. They're going to see my face. He gets in his car and he drives home and again, feels defeated because this was the second girl now that he ended up not taking. Oh, oh. I thought something was missing. So since he's not really having luck with getting many girls, he decides to kind of go back to his roots a little bit. The next day, he goes out to another parking garage for a mall, and that is when he approaches 22-year-old Linda Seely. He basically approaches her with a fake police badge and says he is an undercover cop, and he has been doing some research lately on recent thievery going on in the mall, and she fits the exact description for this crime, and in order to prove herself innocent, of this crime, she's gonna have to get in the back of his car so they can go to the police station for questioning. Linda, of course, was like, I'm not stealing anything. Like, you can check my receipts. Jerry obviously wasn't a police officer, so he wasn't gonna take that for an answer. He was like, no, you're stealing stuff. You fit the description, la da 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 So she gets in the back seat. Obviously, they don't go to the police station. They go to Jerry's house. And immediately when they pull up to Jerry's house, that is when Linda starts to realize that Jerry is not a cop and she is not going to be taken in for questioning. Jerry pulls out his fake gun and points it at Linda and directs her to go into the garage. And the reason why the family never went into the garage um, is because that was like known as his man cave, basically. Like he was always building things. And since in there, it was like a lot of chemicals and a lot of sharp objects. So every time he would leave, he would always lock the door. He leaves Linda there tied up and he basically just goes and has dinner with his family came back and Linda was still there but the weird part is that Linda was now untied but she didn't do anything she didn't scream she didn't try to run away and this could also be due to shock or maybe she had just managed to get herself free and that is exactly when Jerry walked in now after this um Jerry did the same thing to Linda as he did with the other girls just tie her up on a pulley and hang her took her body tied her up to a heavy car part, threw her in the same lake. Two weeks later, a fisherman was fishing in the same river that, you know, Jerry threw all the bodies in, and all of a sudden, a body 
floats to the surface. And so immediately when he sees this body, he calls the police and the police identify the body as Linda, you know, the girl that we just talked about, the fourth victim. She floats to the top. Two days later, another body floats to the top and that woman was Karen. Karen was the girl that was supposed to go to the department store with her mom, but then she never showed up, but her car was in the parking lot. Police were examining these bodies. They knew that it was most likely made by the same exact person because as I said, he would tie a heavy car part to the body. The type of knot used when like tying these car parts to the women were specific knots that you would only use if you were an electrician. And also it was the same knot on both bodies. So they knew that this was, you know, done by the same person. They sent out divers to go and examine the rest of the river. And that is when they found the remaining two bodies. The police started doing coverage on it because obviously this is a very very scary situation and they want to warn all young women in this area like be careful if you're walking home at night make sure to always call someone whenever you're going out or coming in as for Jerry this news coverage did not really scare him at all he just thought that he was so above the police and he was not going to get caught so he just continued to do what he was you know usually doing so he would stand outside dorm rooms and just watch all of the women through their dorm room windows Jerry would call the dorm room room numbers ask for a random name and just hope that that name is like belongs to one of the women in that room this surprisingly worked a couple of times when he would talk to these women he would just like again gloat about himself I was a war veteran I have like all this money I have all these cars I'm super rich and by the end sometimes he would ask the girl on a date nine times out of ten the girl would just never show up and blow him off because they realized like wait this is actually kind of creepy because all these women are being found in a river but that one time there was a woman that actually did go on the date because she thought it was kind of romantic this mystery man now I'm gonna go on a date with him she goes on this date with him and immediately she already gets the heebie-jeebies around him he's super weird super awkward the first thing that she noticed that was super super weird he kept on bringing up the girls that were missing in the lake kept on saying like oh those bodies found in the lake like that's really sad right like what do you think about it like what do you think the killer is like you never really see men being killed by women as much as you see you know women being killed by men and so jerry's like oh my god that's so right really awkward because she was like okay this is a first date like why are you talking about murder second red flag is that jerry actually offered to give the woman a massage giving her the massage he told her to act like she was really sad so she just like was pretending and like acting like she was sad he was like no you know you're not sad enough like think about all those dead bodies in the river like think about how those girls felt before they died probably so scared really really weird and so then after the whole date she immediately called the police and told them exactly what went on it was this guy of this description which you know matched the same description of that attempted abduction that you know of the parking garage the police now finally have some sort of connection so the police tell the woman like hey call him back ask him for a second date she gets on the phone with him she starts talking with him and she's like hey i really liked the way that our date went last time why don't we go on a second date like okay yeah i'll be there in like an hour like he he was ready she calls the police she's like okay he's gonna be here in an hour because he's taking me on a date he's probably gonna come through like the main door so just like stake out there or something please show up they stake out at the front doors and eventually what do you know jerry walks in so the police stop jerry and they're like hey hey, we do this to every man that walks into the building. There's been like this mysterious man calling all of the dorm room women here and also with like the women being found in the river. We're just asking questions to every man that walks in here. And Jerry was surprisingly like pretty okay with this. Like he didn't act nervous. So then they start asking him questions of like, oh, well, what's your name? Where do you live? What do you do? And when he said what he did, he said that he was an electrician. First similarity. Second similarity, he fit the exact description of the last girl. They also asked him, why are you here right now? 
And Jerry says that he was helping a neighbor garden in the area and he's always driven past this college but never knew what it looked like on the inside. So he just wanted to take a little walk through through the lobby, you know, like appreciate the architecture. Um, that's basically his reasoning for being there, which was the third red flag from police because they're like, okay, if he truly wasn't doing anything wrong, why would he lie about, you know, the reason of why he was here? He eventually let him go because they weren't gonna arrest him right there they didn't know if they even had the right guy. So they went back to the station, they ran his name through the system, and that is when they found his past charges about when he was in the psychiatric hospital for nine months. Not only does this man fit the description, he's also an electrician, but he also has a track record of abusing women. So as I said, Jerry used to move around a lot. Like there was a moment in Jerry's life where he used to move around a lot with his family because he wanted to make more money so they could support their second child on the way. So whilst they were moving around a lot, wherever Jerry was, that's where the women went missing. They got a location on Jerry, you know, they know where he's at, but they just can't like pry on him because if they're too hard on, Jerry might run away and then they really don't know where he's at. So then that is when the police decide to perform a stakeout in front of Jerry's house. So there was a police officer that staked out in front of Jerry's house for a couple of days. And then all of a sudden on like the third day of this stakeout, he sees Jerry, his wife and his whole family pack up a bunch of stuff and get into their car and drive north. Police officer sees this, he starts calling around saying like, oh, keep track of this car, this is the license plate. And they also called the borders as well to make sure that Jerry wasn't going out of the country. And thank God they did call the borders because all of a sudden the Canadian border calls up the police and says, hey, we got this car that like fits your description, that fit the license plate number. Well, the police got a search warrant. They went to the car, they searched the car. And weirdly enough, when they checked the car to see who was inside, it was the mom driving and the two young kids in the back seat but no Jerry. They take the wife, the two kids out of the car, they examine the whole car and laying down in the back seat on the floor with a blanket over him was Jerry. So the police took Jerry into custody, took him back to the police station for questioning whilst the wife and the two children went back to the house. You know how like when you're in the station, you get at least one phone call. So Jerry actually called his wife and told his wife, get the key for the garage, make sure the children are not around, go in the garage and just burn everything. She went to the garage and she burned as many pictures, as many trophies as she could, but unfortunately the police kind of caught her in the act of, you know, destroying evidence, which is a huge crime. They took her into custody as well. They eventually found the like breast, they found all the pictures or like most of the pictures, they found all the underwear, they found all the shoes, and so then that's when they knew that, you know, Jerry was the guy they'd been looking for. So then they officially officially arrested Jerry and he was put into jail. He was only charged with the murder of three out of the four girls. The one that he wasn't charged with was the very first girl, the door-to-door -door salesman for encyclopedias, because with her, you know how he chopped off her foot? Basically, I explained this very poorly. Um, essentially, the police could not find the foot, even though after the fact, Jerry had confessed to taking off her foot. The foot was just nowhere to be found and even to this day no one knows what happened to it like no one knows if maybe Darcy had burned it or she hid it or maybe he threw it into the lake and the divers just weren't able to find it. They couldn't find the foot and since they couldn't find the foot there was technically no evidence against him and also as I said Darcy had burned most of the pictures and all of the pictures that he took of this 19 year old girl had been burned by Darcy. So technically there was no evidence against against him with her, so he wasn't charged with that, although he did confess to it later on. So he was only charged with three out of the four and he was given three life sentences. And as for the wife, Darcy, she got absolutely no time at all. And they also didn't have proof that she like was an accomplice to any of this. They didn't know that like, oh, well, like maybe she was, you know, just unaware, which 
she knew. She was driving that car when her husband was in the back seat lying down under a blanket like she knew. The wife and the two kids were given um, new identities after that. Now, as far as Jerry in jail, he would frequently help the prison with all of like their electrician problems. So every time there was like a problem in like another wing or this wing or like the cafeteria, etc., etc., he was basically just being transported all around the prison, like working all day as like a reward for all of his hard work doing the jobs. They would give him shoe catalogs, pedicure catalogs. Even if the guards got caught, they couldn't really get in trouble for it because they're just shopping catalogs. Fast forward to March 26th of 2006, Jerry actually passed away at the age of 67 due to liver cancer. So that's basically the story of Jerry Brodus. I just think men are scary. I know, unpopular opinion, but hypothesis. Maybe when people always say like, men are the majority when it comes to serial killers, men are always killing women. What if there are just as many women serial killers as there are male killers, except the male killers get caught? Because women tend to be very powerful and smart and intelligent and don't do things on a whim or throw bodies in a lake where anyone is gonna find it. Tied to a car part, a car part that rusts after a while. And so when that car part does rust, it's gonna be released and the body's gonna float up anyways. I'm not saying like m m women serial killers don't exist. We literally talked about Brenda Spencer. Yes, that is today's video. Again, I hope you guys found this interesting. And if you did, make sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe. If you want to follow any of my social medias, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And also, also, all of the products that I use on my face. So you're like, Haley, what is that blue shadow? That will be linked down below. Any updates? Oh my God. Don't tell the police, but I got this. I got this. You know, the, the series 50 Shades of Grey. I used to read that when I was younger, like secretly. I used to be like, tut, tut, tut. but it's from Christian's perspective, not Anastasia. Look what I got in the mail today. Look how cute. Christine sent me little nail polishes. I love that woman so much. You're a little cutie pie on the mode. Look at this. Yeah, so link in bio if you want. Thank you, Christine. I love you so much. And I'm so excited to put this on my nails for Thanksgiving. 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 Hmm. Decisions, decisions. Oh my God. Yeah. Here's another thing. Um, I've been really into... I'm not going to say that. Actually, no. I've been really into Spanish music recently. So if you guys have any good Spanish songs, I'm trying to get better at Spanish too. I'm literally just talking out loud, like y'all do not care. I listen to a lot of Spanish music and I don't know what they're saying, but I love it so much. Have you ever heard, I'm not gonna even try to pronounce the name of the band, the name of this band and then this one as well, not a band, but like a singular person, this one as well this one as well. I've been really into that sort of music recently. I heard Fire Up by this band. There was this one part. I watched the live version of that song and there was this part in the song where he was playing the guitar and like, oh my God, that man, he went and I was like, yo. That's my life update. So yeah, don't be surprised if next video I'm fluent in Spanish. That is basically it for today's video. Again, I hope you guys, you know, enjoy the rest of your day. And I will see you guys next week, um, the day after Thanksgiving. We can all eat Thanksgiving leftovers if you're in the U.S. If you're anywhere else, I know Canada has, like, Thanksgiving a different day. I hope you guys enjoyed. I love you. I love you very, very much. And do something that makes you happy today.